Hey, what's up guys? Phoenix here, and this video is giving me another Yu-Gi-Oh! deck profile video, and this time it is going to be on a more rogue option, a not too competitively viable deck, but still a deck that is very close to my own heart, being the archetype that is my favorite archetype that has ever existed that I've played in the game of Yu-Gi-Oh! And for those of you that have been subscribed to my channel for any amount of time, you should know right away that that is without a doubt Dragoonides. I absolutely love this archetype. I love this deck. Anytime there's a chance to like take the cards out of a box, build a deck out of them, and Therio with them, and Solitaire with them, I'm always just so down to do that because this deck is so high in terms of its output ceiling because of how well the Dragoonity archetype itself meshes with good generic dragon support that has been released over the past couple of years. And even non-dragon related support, even things like Boxia, have different loops and things that are integratable into Dragoonity decks. It basically, the ceiling of the Dragoonity archetype in terms of what it facilitates because of the combo pieces that it allows is really high and very wide and broad in spectrum. It basically just dictates like how you want the combo to function based off what combo pieces you included in your deck building part of the deck. So there's such a wide scope of what you can do with this archetype and deck and its ceiling is incredibly high, but unfortunately, consistently has been a problem, you know, in the past as well as the present. But the reason for Therioing with this deck now is because we've gotten a new card in Maximum Crisis that helps the consistency of this deck quite a bit. So with that being, you know, added to the deck, the, you know, added consistency of this new card, definitely wanted to take some time to take the deck out and do some Therio with it. And so what I've got for you today is a very basic build of what I've been testing. It's very like bare bones in terms of what it's trying to do in terms of its grand scheme of scope. It's not trying to do anything too elaborate, uh, but it is trying to just make huge boards consistently that are very good in the current format in terms of like how they're structured. But anyway, the deck list is as follows. It is 40 cards. It is three copies of Dragoonity Ducks. Obviously your staple playmaker. If you're playing less than three of this, then you probably haven't read the card. And one copy of Blackwing Zephyros the Elite. This is a very, very good extender, but you don't want to run more than one of it in this specific version simply because you've got so many other like good extenders as far as like making your combos into three card combos that allow you to access this card in a better way. So playing one of it is just fine. It contributes to bricks at more than one, unfortunately. Even though you do have like multiple copies of Ravine, it contributes subpar combos when you draw it, essentially. When you're trying to just do Ravine Zephyrus, it's a really subpar combo compared to what you can do uh, with other cards. But two Garuda to the Wind Spirit, this is just a good level four extender because it allows you to make things like Dweller mid combo string, which is very strong in the current format against True King Dino and True Draco. Uh, so that's like something that's very like important is being able to like make like turn one Stardust or Crystal Wing Dweller. Um, alongside like Red Med is something that this card helps you facilitate with if you don't draw into Instant Fusion uh, because all of your three card combos allow you to put Zephyros on the board mid combo and then if you're able to you know search this or just have it and drop it that lets you make a rank four which is really important and then one copy of Miss Valley Baby Rock this card is kind of just bricky in nature uh, but it is very good to like add and send off of your Gator mid combo string to allow you to just get an extra tuner in circulation to meld your finishing boards um, I've thought about putting it up to two. I don't know if I'd play any more than that for this specific build, but it, like I said, it facilitates like bricky hands. Like even though we have more consistency field spell wise, I don't want to rock the boat and like put other cards that are like really generically bricky like Baby Rock. Even though it does facilitate some combos when it's in your hand, uh, it just it's not they're not the best combos. So you just want to like play other combo pieces that allow you to get into those better combos. And Garuda, Mistleton, and Instant Fusion are definitely the cards that facilitate those combos. So that's why they're like higher in quantity. Uh, Mistleton is a two of though. I just haven't found room for the third one. Um, honestly, I probably put the third one in, but even then I'd probably put the third Garuda in before the third Mistleton. Um, just because of the fact that Garuda does allow you to do the Dweller plays and stuff like that, while still giving you the same sort of access Mistleton does in terms of your uh, big combo strings, uh, you just have to waste a Vajrayana with Garuda, but still, Mistleton is definitely a card I would probably up in quantity if I had the room for it, uh, but unfortunately you just have to dedicate a few spaces in this deck to other things in order to boost the overall consistency of the deck. Uh, but one copy of Red Eyes Darkness Metal Dragon, if this card ever went to more than one copy per deck, I would probably be playing more than one copy. Uh, just because this card does amazing things for this deck specifically because it just allows you to gain basically just plus ones every turn that it stays alive. Every time that you use its effect, it's a plus one. Usually during your first turn combos, you're using its effect twice. And then every turn that it stays alive, it is an additional plus one. Uh, which turns like all of your big boss monsters into floaters because all your big boss monsters are things like Crystal Wing, Stardust Dragon, Stardust Spark, Scrap Dragon. Those are all cards that can do things to the game state and they're boss monsters, but then they're also floaters because of Darkness Metal's existence in the game because of its presence. So if they die, they can just come straight back and that's just huge. 
that's absolutely like amazing like you see thick cards like true king's return true king's revival and stuff like that and you see why those cards are good this card is good for the exact same reason except this card is a monster that also has legs also has attack points but three tuners the only three we're playing is three copies of dragoonie phalanx uh Achilles just isn't really that applicable in the format right now uh it's not a very back row or controlly based format so legionnaire Achilles hasn't really been good in years uh you just want to you just want a combo and this card facilitates those combos uh but then for the rest of the monsters we're playing just hand traps out the wazoo we're playing four total hand traps we're playing two copies of ash blossom and joy spring because this card is you know obviously incredibly good and then we're playing one copy of maxi and then we're playing one copy of dd crow dd crow is actually really good this format as well but it's incredibly good in this deck, for example, because of the fact that you can draw hands that have multiple combo pieces in them, like say f like four or five combo pieces, and if any of those are monsters, mid combo string, you're able to use Gator to add DD Crow and then discard whatever duplicate monster you had in your hand, like if you had duplicate Mistletons, duplicate uh, Phalanxes, uh, things like that. You can add this to your hand, essentially searching a trap off of your Gaederg, which is actually just insane. Like, searching a hand trap like DD Crow means that, like, all of the zoo plays that involve Norden are very, very, like, like not an option for them because you're just going to crow whatever you whatever they target with Norden, uh, meaning the fusion sub plays basically just get much more limited in scope uh, and all that sort of stuff. Like, DD Crow is just a fantastic hand trap against zoo and zoo variants in this format, and being able to search it in this deck just makes it actually just really valuable um, and allows you to, like, basically facilitate, like, getting rid of problems that this deck has, which is the fact that you could just draw multiple combo pieces and no traps, but now we have a very good hand trap that we can search off of that. But So that's all of the monsters. I believe it is 17, if I remember correctly, if my count is correct. Uh, but going on to the spells, we have two copies of Dragon Ravine, two copies of Magical Midbreaker Field, three terraforming and three of the new card for maximum crisis set rotation now the reason we're playing magical midbreaker field is because of set rotation for those of you that do not know what this card does this card says take two different field spell cards from your deck and set them to set one of them to your field spell zone and set one to your opponent's field spell zone so you set dragon ravine to your field and you set magical midbreaker field to your opponent's field and then as long as either it's like either one of them stays set on the field neither player can activate or set new field spell cards so you can flip over the dragon ravine and use it that turn but if your opponent doesn't flip magical midbreaker field they cannot activate their own field spells so against decks like abc against uh invoked and against um against true draco they can't activate their dragonic diagrams their magical meltdowns or their union hangers as long as this remains set in their field spell zone so why don't they just activate it and then activate their own field spell? Well, they're not going to be able to do that because Magical Midbreaker Field's effect is during either player's main phase one, it turns all of your monsters into Magispectors from your opponent's card effects and vice versa. Their monsters can't be targeted or destroyed by your card effects and your monsters can't be targeted or destroyed by their card effects during both players' main phase one. But also its other effect is that while this card remains face up on the field in a field spell zone, you, the controller of this card, cannot activate or set other field spells. So they either leave it set and they can't activate their field spells because of set rotation's effect, allowing them to not activate or set new field spells because of the lingering effect off set rotation, or they activate Magical Midbreaker Field, they make both of our monsters Magispectors against their opposing card effects. And then they also can't activate field spells because Magical Midbreaker Field says you can't activate or set other field spells while you control this card in your field spell zone. So. Basically, it Imperial orders field spell decks because of the fact that you're going to go set rotation, set your ravine, set magical midbreaker to their field. It stays set and they can't activate anything, or they activate it and its effect prevents them from activating anything. So it's just a wonderful little addition to the deck, and it basically gives you eight copies of Dragon Ravine because you've got the three Terras, the two ravines, and three set rotations themselves, making eight copies total. Now, going first, the percentage of seeing one of these eight cards is now 69.4%. So basically, 70% of your games, you should see Dragon Ravine, which is a big improvement over like the 50. 5% we had when it was just these five cards and then going second the chances go up to 76.4% uh, of seeing Dragon Ravine or one of the cards that accesses Dragon Ravine going second so like the consistency for getting to Ravine has never been higher in this deck I don't want to I don't think I can stress that enough they have never been higher even when we had three Ravine three terraforming and three upstart goblin it was still only like a little bit under 75% but going second, now it's actually just greater than that because of the fact that we have set rotation. And also set rotation is just really good, again, like I said, because against decks that revolve around resolving their field spells, like Dragonic Diagram, Union Hanger, uh, Magical Meltdown, etc., Magical Midbreaker Field literally just locks them out of their field spell for the entirety of the game. So 
That was a bit windy uh, as far as an explanation, but it had to be explained uh, for why I ran these cards. But continuing on, two copies of Cards of Constance just to start, you know, getting duplicate phalanxes out of your hands, drawing new cards, trying to get into your engine. Uh, one of is Foolish Burial and Soul Charge. I'm not playing Upstart in this list. I just don't have room for it uh, based off, like, the defensive cards and stuff I want to run. But I don't see it necessary. Uh, I could play it of the consistency of Drawing Ravine even more, even though it's only at 70%. Uh, but, like, still... It's just one of those things where uh, if I find a, if I find a card that I don't want in my deck anymore, then I'll probably just swap it for upstart. But uh, last three spells in the deck are uh, three copies of Instant Fusion. This is like the best combo opener because you know Ravine Flanks and Instant Fusion is just insane because you get the Norden and the Norden brings back Ducks. Uh, so then you have just another level four chilling. So that also allows you to go into the Dweller play, um, where you go like Dweller Stardust Red Med or Dweller Crystal Wing Red Med Atom uh, stuff like that. It just allows you a lot of freedom of movement in terms of your plays. It also allows you a lot of recovery. Uh, this deck doesn't really lose to like Valor anymore with the co with the combination of Mistleton and Instant Fusion in the deck. So like if they if they Valor your Ducks, you can Mistleton over it. If they Valor that, then if you have Instant Fusion, then you just laugh at them because you Norden the Flanks back, and then you still have an Atum combo. So like you just have a lot of like freedom of uh, of like recovery with this deck because of Instant Fusion and because of Soul Charge and like all that. But moving on to the traps, so there are only. A very, very few of them because we have so many hand traps in the deck. We've got two strike and a warning. Uh, the reason this isn't three strikes is because warning is just a little bit better against like true Draco and stuff like that. Uh, but both are just equally as effective against uh, true king Dino. Like if you just if you strike or warning the Earth true king in their hand, like they literally like in their turn. It's very hard for the tr like the Dino deck to play without the true kings. Uh, but then we have one copy of Imperial Order and then two copy of Dragon's Bind. Uh, Dragon's Bind is a very, very solid card, specifically against Zoo and the Dino variants. Uh, because you make Dragon's Bind with like Stardust Spark Up or Stardust Dragon Up, and your opponent literally can't summon anything that's less attack points than them. It also protects you against like the most like relevant Kaijus in the format right now. Gamma Seal and uh, Humongous are both 22 and 2400, so they're both weaker than Stardust Spark, so you can't get Kaijued if they have those Kaijus in hand and you have Dragon Bind Up. Uh, so there's there's a lot of different things like that that actually just come into play with why this card's really good. Uh, I feel like I would play three of it if True Draco wasn't a deck that could just tribute summon a monster uh, and basically just like invalidate this card. Uh, but then again, like I'd probably be playing Dimensional Barriers if that wasn't the case either. But moving on to the extra deck, this video is getting pretty long, but I had to explain that magical midbreaker field set rotation nonsense, or else people would just spam the comments with what is what are these cards in your deck for? Uh, but unfortunately, you do have to play those cards. Otherwise, there there are definitely two cards I would love to have in my deck over magical midbreaker field. It'd be like the second uh, baby rock and then like upstart goblin, but you have to play those cards, unfortunately. But for the extra deck, one copy of Gator, uh, three copies of Vajrayana, one copy of Coral Dragon for your sixes. Coral Dragon obviously just being a nice bit of spot removal that you can have on the way up into your plays. For level eights, one Stardust Dragon, one Stardust Spark Dragon. If I wasn't running Dragon's Bind, this wouldn't be in my list. Um, just because this card just synergizes really well with Dragon's Bind, so it just seems like a card that's just worth it for the inclusion. Uh, one Scrap Dragon, again, more just removal, spot removal, uh, so it allows you to just do things. Uh, also, if like your opponent like pops your Dragon Ravine after set rotation uh, was active and they have their own field spell set, I can't activate any more Dragon Ravines, so if you have a way to get into Scrap Dragon and then just pop that field spell, then you can activate your field spells again. So there is a little bit of risk there, but I mean, it's still still perfectly fine. But then one copy of Cypher Lord Omega, not really banking on drawing Soul Charge, and that's really the only plays that you need two Omegas for. Um, oh, I don't know. Omega would definitely be at two if Spark Dragon wasn't in this extra deck, uh, just because of the fact that like, uh, like you just want to loop into things. And like it clears your board. Uh, while also being a resource that comes back and also taking away cards from your opponent So a lot of combos do focus on summoning like two of this uh, But then one crystal wing because this card is like made for Dragoonies. This card is like the nut This card is fantastic. Uh, if your opponent kills it, you just bring it back with darkness metal. It's fantastic Kaiju over it cool darkness metal it back you better That's the thing with this deck is that this deck just puts up so many boards that have like multi layers of protection Where it's just like cool you kaiju the crystal wing you better out this darkness metal or else it's coming right back uh, cool, you added the Stardust, you better out the Darkness Metal, it's coming right back. Like, things like that, just all of this stuff, it just, it's really good at pressuring. But the only three Xyz that I play are uh, Ptolemy M7, one uh, Dragon King Hieratic Atom Man, and then the one Abyss Dweller, as I uh, aforementioned said. This is the only rank 4 I run. Uh, this card is just really good uh, to access mid-combo, like I've said before. 
Uh, being able to go turn one like Stardust Dweller is fantastic uh, because of the fact that you're just going to be able to negate all the like spells and traps that go to grave off True Draco. You negate all the baby dinosaur floaters and all that sort of stuff, and it just works out really well in your favor. Uh, Dweller is just, again, another amazing card in this format. And then the two instant fusion targets are Norden and Mavelis. Mavelis I've literally never made as long as it's existed since Norden has come out. This might just be cut out of the extra deck, but I'm just too afraid that as soon as I cut it, I'm going to open, like, instant fusion phalanx and four traps. And, uh, or, like, four traps and hand traps, and I'm just going to have to just Norden and make Coral Dragon pass. Whereas with Mavelis I can make, like, Crystal Wing and set four or do whatever. Um, but this card really doesn't really have that big of a function as long as Norden exists because all the Norden combos are better than the Mavelis combos. Uh, but it does still exist in case you, like, draw multiple Instafusions or whatever. I don't know. This could be another Cypher Lord Omega as well, uh, just to allow some of the plays to be more extensive in reach. It could be, like, Queen Dragon Jin or something like that. Or it could be, uh, it could be Gaia Dragon the Thunder Charger. There's, there's a lot of things that this card could be. But anyway, that is my current take on the Dragoonity deck for this format, the post-maximum crisis format. With set rotation, this deck gains a ton of consistency. Like I said, you now have a 70% chance of opening Dragon Ravine going first which is insane we've never had chances that high since dragon ravine was banned like when dragon ravine came back we had the draw rule change and that's just really been a huge huge thorn in uh, in the deck side because even before the draw rule changed with three ravine and three terraforming drawing into six cards in a 40 card deck going first i believe if i remember correctly from all those times i did math in the past i believe the chances were 65 percent and so now we actually have a greater percent than we've ever had in the past without upstarts in the deck. Uh, and also, like, it's just with two Dragon Ravines and the draw five rule. So if we ever had, uh, like, the third Dragon Ravine come back, then we would just have tons of nonsense that we'd be able to do as far as consistency-wise. But anyway, this has been a rather windy and lengthy deck profile. Sorry about that. It's just how these things typically go when I have to explain things about a deck that I love. So, saws fam, but I'm sure you guys understand. But anyway, as always, guys, thanks for watching. Let me know what your thoughts are in the comments down below. As always, links are in the description of my Facebook and Patreon pages if you want to support the channel directly and help some pipe dreams that I have for the future come into fruition a bit faster, then definitely check out the Patreon page. And if you want to get into access to my Discord server, my private Discord server, or a monthly giveaway that I do at the end of each month for some Konami products, Product, then definitely check out the reward tiers over there as well and see if there's anything to your liking but other than that if you want to indirectly support the channel and while also buying or selling cards for yourself then definitely check out second chance gaming's website which is also linked in the description they are a direct sponsor of me and this channel and i'm a big fan of how they do business with what i've dealt with thus far top-notch service from what i've received from them and support from them in general but other than that like i've already said thanks for watching let me know what your thoughts are again in the comments down below thanks for your time as usual thanks for watching again guys let me know what you think let me know if you like dragoonies in the comments down below with a hashtag dragoonity lovers i don't know man let's just do this shit i'm just so hype when every time i get to play this deck i'm just so excited i i always love when i'm able to like do things with this deck and i'm so happy that consistency is like through the roof in terms of what we have access to but anyway i'm gonna stop rambling now before this video becomes 20 minutes long as i've already said thanks for watching thanks for your time as usual guys hashtag dragoonity love in the comments down below if you made it this far and take care guys i will see you in the next video